to grace how great a tender day I come to be let my goodness like a feather like my wandering heart to be come to wonder Lord I feel it welcome to the uh Facebook Live for Calvary Baptist Church Athens. We are still in the midst of our uh, lockdown, shut-in, uh, shelter-in-place, quarantine, whatever you want to call it. And uh, we are missing everyone, uh, missing being together as a church, assembling together. But we are very grateful we have this opportunity and the technology that's available today that wouldn't have been there just a few years ago. And so... Uh, we're welcoming you to that. We're going to do some quick announcements, and then we'll have another song just to make sure everybody's online with us. And then I'll come back with the sermon from Romans chapter 8 after that. So just to uh, let you know, <clears throat> um, it doesn't look like the lockdown is going to be lifted any time before Easter, Sunday the 12th. And with that in mind, we're planning for an Easter drive-in service. Now, we've got to check some things. We've got to make sure the city and everybody else is not going to be upset about it. But we're going to try plan for that. We're going to have uh, Brother Jonathan uh, lead us in a couple of songs, two or three songs of worship. And then Brother Harry is going to do announcements. And then I'm going to preach. And it'll be just like a regular service, except you'll be in your cars facing us. And we'll be preaching from the, for the front porch here. And so it'll be something new for all of us. And if nothing else, uh, just being able to assemble together in our cars uh, something I don't think the New Testament ever talked about, but uh, nevertheless, it's still assembling. It'd be great to see you. And we're planning on having some um, uh, Easter baskets for our kids that they can pick up on the way out. Also, if you need to give your offerings and your tithes, we'll have somebody designated to collect that as well. So it'll give us an opportunity to uh, be together as a church, even though it'll be a little bit different. Uh, there are now two cases of a coronavirus in Henderson County. Please remember to pray for those families. As far as I know, both of them are at home in quarantine with their families. And still we don't have a, uh, a major problem in the hospitals at all. Um, again, if you need something and you can't get to it, or you're worried about getting out, please contact uh, uh, Leora and I, contact Brother Harry, Brother Jason, uh, any of our church uh, members or leaders that can get out will be more than happy to go do that for you so do that through texting through that through messaging uh, any way that you can get to us uh, give us a call and we will help out in any way that we can uh, we'll be back on facebook live um, tonight and then of course next sunday and then in the next upcoming few weeks we're hoping to have uh, sunday school lessons and also our other preachers uh, put some messages together for wednesdays or sunday nights also and then uh, when we get all this behind us, we are still planning for the potluck of potlucks and uh, having a great opportunity to really come together as a church. So God bless, keep praying, and keep one another before the throne of grace. All right, I have another song, and then I'll come back with a message from Romans chapter 8. We have been uh, 
going through several passages of scripture during this uh, time of uncertainty in our nation, in our town, in our church. And as I was looking back over the sermons that I had preached and the different texts that I had chosen, each one of them had a special meaning to me as a scripture that I could go to and have gone to many times in the past, both as a pastor in hospital visitation, uh, with my own uh, heart surgery that I had uh, a few years ago. These were the scriptures that gave me assurance. Uh, I could hear the voice of the Lord speaking to me in these passages of scripture and telling me not to be afraid that he knew what was happening and he had all these things under control. Nothing was taking me by surprise. And for me as his child to look past this to eternity itself because that is the ultimate uh, promise and the ultimate security that we are safe with him. And so passages like Psalms 91 have always been a, a great source of comfort. Psalms 23, Psalms 27, uh, 2 Kings 4, it shall be well. And this one that we're looking at today in Romans chapter 8, I go back to these time and time again. They, they never get old. Uh, they never seem to be something that I know well enough that I can uh, bypass reading it. <clears throat> the more I read it, the more it stays with me, the more the Holy Spirit can bring those things back to memory. And there are times in which I just simply need to know that I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And the Holy Spirit can bring that forward as I study it and as I read it and as I put it to work in my life. You know, we're living in fearful times. There's a great deal of uncertainty. Even before all of this happened, we still were going through uh, conflicting opinions, opposing conclusions of what is happening, what's going to happen. And now we have to deal with these things as a nation, as an individuals under this uh, pandemic that we are now facing. Fear is something that this world has in abundance. And this world loves to create even more fear. It sometimes seems that it thrives on fear. Our media, uh, our social uh, interactions, uh, those things rise to the top and they sometimes drown out the other voices and, and the other things that should make us have a, a better perspective of what's really going on. You know, sometimes it, you look back and you realize that truly we were overreacting or we were a little too fearful in certain areas. Now, this next part I'm going to talk about, you, it might, you may find this to be a little bit um, unbelievable that nobody ever did this or nobody ever said this, but supposedly, according to some studies done in the 1980s, these actual studies took place and scientists actually made these kinds of predictions based upon projections, based upon what's happening now. And if we just project that out to the future, here's how bad it's going to be. Uh, so some fearful scientists have predicted these things in the past. That if everyone keeps stacking National Geographic's in garages and attics, instead of throwing them away, the magazine's weight will sink the continent 100 feet. And sometime soon we'll be inundated by the oceans because our nation has sunk because of the weight of National Geographic. Now, if you think that's strange, and it is, don't forget that a few years ago there was a senator, uh, or perhaps he was a congressman in uh, Washington, D.C., who actually asked in a public forum if too many people on the island of Guam would cause the island to flip and capsize. And so if you think that that fear is unfounded, keep in mind, some people must have believed it, at least in Congress. I won't tell you what party he was a member of. But I think you can guess. Uh, some other things. Another study found that if the number of microscope specimen slides submitted to one St. Louis hospital lab continued to increase at the current rate that it was increasing, that the city of St. Louis would be buried under three feet of glass by the year 2224. And here's another one. If beachgoers keep returning home with as much sand clinging to them as they do now, 80% of the country's coastline will disappear in 10 years. Uh, it's also been reported that pickles can cause cancer, communism, airplane crashes, auto wrecks, and even crime waves. Now, if you think that that sounds a little preposterous, keep this in mind. 99.9% .9 of all cancer victims have eaten pickles sometimes in their life. 96.8% of all communist sympathizers have eaten pickles. 99.7% of everybody that's been in a car wreck or airplane pilots have also eaten pickles. 
And keep this in mind, this is the, the, the fact of all facts. Back in the 1850s, everybody ate pickles, and everybody from the 1850s is now dead. So if you keep those things in mind, you shouldn't be afraid of COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Fear the pickle. It's the pickle that we have to watch out for. Now, again, those are things that should help us keep in perspective and keep in mind. Fear sometimes can take on a life itself, and sometimes you can be afraid of things that you should never be afraid of just because we sometimes like fear. We thrive on fear. We look for it in places it shouldn't be. But there are many real fears in this world. And we need to be dealing with those in the way that God's word tells us to. I don't have the answer to the fear of the pickle or National Geographic's. And I don't have the answer to uh, all of the conflicting opinions about what's going to happen next with this uh, pandemic that's underneath us. But I do have the answer to fear. And that's here in God's word. God's word gives us the absolute roadmap, the guideline to dealing not just with foolish fears, but with the real things that we should be afraid of in this world and in our hearts and in our lives. And so I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And as you're turning there, I just want to do a very quick review about the book of Romans. Because the book of Romans for the Christian is a road map of our beliefs, our hopes, and our ways to live. Paul wrote it to a group of Christians he was not sure that he was ever going to see. And he wanted to give them the way in which they should live their Christian life. And so from how to be saved to how to live their life uh, to what was coming next as far as the Lord uh, dealing with them and dealing with the nation of Israel... He wrote all that out in the book of Romans. And every Christian should be well aware of what it says. And Romans chapter 8 is one of those chapters that we should know a great deal about. As you look at Romans as a book, the first three chapters deal with sin. And in those we find that all mankind is guilty before God. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 4 through 5 deals with salvation by God. Uh, Romans chapter 4, 3 says, For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Or well, Romans chapter 5 and uh, verse 8. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And Romans chapter 6 through 8 deals with living with God. And that's what we call sanctification. And we're going to take our sermon from the last part of that, which is victorious living as a child of God. We're calling it um, the defeat of fear, being victorious over fears in our life. And so it's a long chapter, and I can't do it justice uh, here today and, and, and not take too much time. So I'm going to go through this fairly rapidly, fairly quickly. Uh, I know some of you have a fear of preachers who say that too. But I do want to tell you that I want to fill you in on just this outline of the things that um, God and our relationship with him, our salvation, has, fi has freed us from this fear. We have uh, the victory over fear because of what God has done for us. And Romans chapter 8 is kind of a summary of almost everything that's gone before from chapter 1 through chapter 7, especially of chapter 6 and 7. But it is the victorious Christian life. It is, for us, the defeat of fear. So the first thing I want you to notice is in Romans chapter 8, look at the first nine verses. And this is fear defeated by emancipation. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye, the children of God, are not in the flesh, 
but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, of Christ, he is none of his. So in these opening nine verses, we see that we have been freed, that fear has been defeated by emancipation. We have been set free by our emancipation and free from fear, free from condemnation. And the fear of our guilt before God is part of that freedom. We have no fear because we are free in Jesus Christ. Paul says there is now no condemnation. Blanket statement, no loopholes, no exceptions. For the child of God, there is no condemnation. This means that I'm not condemned of God because I am now his child. I'm a member of his family. I put my faith in the death of Jesus Christ and I need never fear the judgment of God for my sin because that sin has been paid by the death of Christ in my place. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Paul says, you no longer need to fear condemnation. If you are a child of God, then you have the Spirit of God within you to overcome your fear, your faults, and even your sin. You are no longer need to fear. You have been set free, emancipated from fear by the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We have seen fear defeated because we have been set free. In um, The Normal Christian Life, written by uh, Watchman Nee, a uh, well-known uh, Christian uh, teacher and preacher in the 1950s and 60s uh, in China, he talks about free from the law of gravity and that, that there's no fear of gravity for birds. He talks about, and I've shortened this, but he says, the Lord says in Matthew 6, Behold the birds, consider the lilies. If we could ask the birds whether they are not afraid of the law of gravity, how would they reply? They would say, we've never heard the name of Newton. We know nothing about his law. We fly because it's the law of our life to fly. Not only is there, is there in them a life with the power of flight, but that life has a law which enables those living creatures quite spontaneously and consistently to overcome the law of gravity. And the same thing is true for us as children of God. We have the law of Jesus Christ in us that has set us free from the law of sin and death and free from the fear and the condemnation that came with who we were. And as long as we live as children of God, we have freedom from that fear. The next thing I want you to notice is in verses 10 and 11. We have been set free and fear has been defeated by regeneration. Romans 8 chapter and the 10th verse. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. We have no fear because we are quickened. Now quickened is an old word used much more back in the King James time than it is today. But it's taken from the Greek word for life, which is the word zoon. When I was learning Greek, I always thought that was, that was a fun word. Uh, life is the word zoon, and it sounds kind of like life. It sounds like living. Uh, we are really in the zoon. Here it means to be made alive. Here it means to be quickened is to be able to be given life. Christians cannot fear. When they realize that before they came to Christ, they were already dead. What could be worse for a human being than to know that we were never really alive, but we're just dead people walking? But that death has been defeated because we have been quickened. We've been made alive for the first time. Why should I be afraid now? I was dead, but through the power of the Spirit and Jesus Christ working in me, I've been made alive. How can I fear anything now? How can I be afraid? I've already passed from death, and if Jesus Christ defeated death, then I know he will also defeat fear in my life. We, as Christians, put our faith and our trust in what the Lord has promised. And even when we're at the graveside, and it's time for us to face the reality of this physical body dying, we still have deliverance from fear. Fear has still been defeated for us. The scriptures that I read most often at graveside services is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. It's familiar to you. And it's not by accident that it's used over and over again when we're dealing with uh, the graveside service. As we're facing this ultimate reality of physical death, this is what Paul said in the 15th chapter, 51st verse. Behold, I show you a mystery. 
We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be, rise, shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible hath put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. No fear of any kind of death. No fear at all for the child of God. Even the grave itself can no longer claim victory and give us something to fear because we have been delivered from that by our relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 12. We have... Fear has been defeated in us by the adoption that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord and the Holy Spirit. In verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we walk, uh, but if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We have no fear because God's Word tells us we are the children of God. Paul boldly proclaims we have not received the spirit of bondage, by the spirit of adoption. And now as the children of God. We cry out Abba. Father. The spirit bears witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. If we could just grasp a small portion of this truth. Every fear we could ever face. Would be instantly vaporized. Gone in a flash of boldness. In the knowledge of who we are. As the children of God. We belong to the family of the creator. And the sustainer of this universe. We walk upon a world that will one day be claimed by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and ruled by us as the people of God. How can I be afraid of anything in this world today? This world may be occupied territory now by the power of sin, but I know the truth. This world and all that is in it will one day be conquered by its rightful ruler and king. When that happens, you and I as children of God, as those who cry out, Abba, Father, will ride behind him and rule with him. Fear has been defeated by my adoption into the family of God. In verses eight, chapter 8, verse 17, we see that fear is now defeated by redemption. And if children, in verse 17, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon... That word means I, I know and account this to be absolutely true. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. We fear, there is no fear for us because we know that we are redeemed. As children of God, Romans chapter 8 tells us, we are also heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Paul points out that yes, we will suffer with Jesus Christ, but he looks past the suffering, he looks past the tribulations and difficulties, and he says, but you know what, For waiting down the road, we're going to be glorified. We're going to be, our, our redemption is going to come fully and completely. The suffering, the sorrows, the persecution, the tribulations can't compare to that glory that will be revealed in us. Paul says, this is the earnest 
expectation. This is the hope that is not just ours, but he says, so great is this hope that all of creation, every creature within creation itself, waits for this. Verse 19 says, creation itself waits in hope for the glorifying of the sons of God. For when they are glorified, then all of creation will become what God originally created it to be. Creation shall be delivered from bondage into the liberty of the children of God. That's an amazing thought. That all of creation is waiting for God's people, God's children, to be fully glorified and their bodies redeemed. And at that moment, in that time and place, in God's plan, all of the world will then be brought to a newness and redemption in and of itself as well. This great hope, Paul says, is the redemption of our bodies. We often call this our final sanctification. This is the final proof of God's love and power. This is the final defeat of fear. Think about this. These bodies, so weakened by sin, so easily inflicted or infected by disease, so quickly run down, so easily conquered by death, these same weak vessels, these same weak bodies, God will redeem. Sin can't even claim them after I'm dead and buried. Now that is something that should give us a deliverance and a victory over fear. If this world can't claim even this poor, dilapidated, beat up, sinful body, and God's even going to claim that, then what can this world do? I have deliverance from those things because even this body is one day going to be redeemed by God. You know, Luke 21 Jesus was the events that are going to take place before he comes back to this world. And he was trying to give hope to those people who will be living during that time. And he, and he says, uh, look for these things. And this is what he says in verse 28 of Luke chapter 21. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. That's also what we should be doing when we're dealing with the fear that is going around us today. We have this assurance. We have this hope. We have this, as Paul puts it, we have this earnest expectation given to us in God's word. So lift up your head because according to God's word and God's promise, your redemption draweth nigh. You know, years ago as a young pastor in my first church, I had a, uh, a lady who was what I would call a nominal Christian. Attended Sunday mornings and not every Sunday morning. Um, her and her husband would come and, and they were members, they were members in good standing, but not what I'd call a strong Christian testimony or strong Christian life. She had her problems. And ultimately, her body was afflicted with cancer. And the cancer was terminal. And I spent night after night going on for weeks and weeks uh, next to her hospital bed as she um, slowly died. And in my mind... I questioned what was going to happen as this nominal Christian. I didn't doubt her salvation, but this is not a strong uh, person who walked in faith. And I questioned what's going to happen as she faces this ultimate trial, uh, as she faces death and cancer and, and, and comes to that point in which there is no hope in and of herself, no hope in the doctors, no hope in the medicine. And I wondered what I would say and I wondered how I would encourage her as a young pastor during that time. I was surprised because the more I was around her, the more I saw her grow in strength. The more I heard her talk about the things of God, the more she talked about the Bible. Uh, the more she depended upon not what I could tell her as a, as a young preacher, but what I knew God had told her years ago or even just the few Sundays before when she was in church and listening to messages given from the pulpit. And I watched as this woman grew weaker and weaker in her flesh, grow stronger and stronger in her spirit. And I learned more from that. What I saw was God taking care of one of his own and delivering her from fear and from that which should if anybody else in this world outside of a child of God would have been utterly devastated, she just became stronger and stronger and stronger until the end it was me going there and being encouraged and me going there and finding hope because of what she was going through. This one time nominal Christian as a child of God just grew stronger. The fear was defeated in her because she knew what God had promised her. That's what we should hope on. 
That's what we should hope in. This body is nothing. This body will be gone one day. But the Lord says, even that poor, frail body, I will claim and one day give back to you. And there is nothing that you should fear. Two more things, very quickly. Verse 26 of Romans chapter 8. Fear has been defeated by intercession. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. There is no fear, the Bible tells us, because the Spirit pleads for us. Our victories over sin, death, and fear continue here in verse 26. Fear is defeated and we have victory through the intercession of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us, the Bible tells us, in our infirmities, and in our weakness, and in our fear. He does this by making intercession for us. He pleads for us as a go-between. He prays and pleads for us even in words that are beyond our, lang our language and our vocabulary. When words fail me, when fear begins to control my thoughts and my prayers, the Holy Spirit, parakletos, takes control. In Him, even in the midst of fear, I possess this great and abiding assurance that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. That's one of those verses that we know instinctively as children of God, I have to hold on to this promise. All things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And that is the truth that the Holy Spirit gives to us even when we don't live it. Even when I don't have the words to express it. Yet the Holy Spirit pleads for us, makes intercession, acts as our go-between and instills in us this instinct, this truth, this powerful promise that in God's will and in God's providence it's going to be okay because we are the children of God. And all things will work together for good. In verses 29 through 30, fear is defeated by predestination. Now, I don't want you to be afraid of the word predestination. It says, there is no fear because we are predestined in verses 29. Take a look at this verse. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. The Bible says this. Don't be afraid of what it says. Glorify or, or boast in this. The Bible says he foreknew us. He knew us as children, as those who would accept his son as Savior. Because of that foreknowledge, who would accept the invitation of his son? He then predestined us. He determined before it happened, and this is what he predestined, not that we'd be saved, but that we'd be conformed to the image of his Son. All this he knew in eternity past, but for us it began in our lifetime, as this scripture says, when he called us to salvation, called us to the cross of Calvary, called us to be the children of God. When we answered that call, he goes on and says, we justified us and he glorified us. Glorified us. All this has been done in the mind of God before the world began. You cannot understand it, but you can know victory and freedom from fear by believing it right now. Everything that you see happening in the world today, God has already seen. And he has seen exactly where you're at in this time and in this, these uh, difficulties and conflicts that you're going through. And he has already, in his mind, in eternity past, known that you would accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, known that you would be his child, and he's already predestined you to be conformed to the image of his Son. He has justified you and he has going to glorify you when that day comes. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Chosen in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us. Notice what he's predestined us to. The adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Wherein he hath made us accepted and beloved. Why should I be afraid? 
God has seen everything from the beginning to the end of time. He has seen what is happening to us today, and he's already determined that his children will not be defeated. He has predetermined that his children will be glorified. Quit being afraid. All of this that we're going through has already been dealt with by that foreknowledge and that predestination of God. It is already taken care of. Don't be afraid of predestination. Boast in it. Glory in it. Because it means it's already been dealt with in the power of God. Let me go to the last part of this. And that's verse 31 through 39. Fear defeated by our justification. One of the... Some of these verses are some of the most powerful that we find in the book of Romans. Sometimes in the book in the entire New Testament. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? Everything that's gone before. What shall we say? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. It is he, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Ye read that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As is written, by thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have no fear because we have been justified, announced and pronounced by God himself that we are now free from sin through his son Jesus Christ. We are justified in his sight. When you look at what goes on in these verses, he says that if God is for us, who dares be against us? He says, who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? He says, who can condemn us? Christ died for our sin. How dare anybody bring a condemnation against us now? He says, who shall separate us from the love of God? He names all these inescapable things. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril of sword. He said, you know what? For all, you take all those things, it means nothing to us. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And then he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. That phrase, more than conquerors, that we have in our translation, is just one word in the Greek, and it's a word that means super victorious. We are super victors in Christ. It means that we are beyond mere victory. We exceed it. We excel it. We go farther and above it than we can possibly imagine because we are the children of God. We are super victors experiencing victory above and beyond the normal understanding and experience of the word because of the power of God working in and through me. He goes on to say, I am persuaded. This word literally means I stand utterly convinced of this. We as Christians, as believers, as overcomers, as children of God, and warriors riding in the host of heaven, we cannot be separated from the love of God. Neither death nor life, angels, principalities, powers, present things, things in the future, height, death, Anything that's been created shall be able to separate us from the love of God. That is confidence. Paul, like a fighter on the battlefield, stands before the enemy and says, Bring it on. I stand in the power of God, and nothing you do can separate me from the one who loves me. Do you today understand that you are also super victorious in Christ, just as Paul was? There was nothing special that Paul had in his relationship with God that you don't have. Now, he may have had other talents and abilities that God used in different ways than he's using yours. But your relationship is based upon the same thing that Paul's relationship was based upon. And that's grace and mercy through the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior, dying upon the cross. That is justification. And we have been announced free from guilt pronounced free from guilt by God the Father because of what His Son has done. And because of that, we are super victorious. Nothing can separate us. We have the defeat of fear in our life because we've been justified by the gift of God. I've probably gone on a little long, so let me bring this to conclusion with a little story about a missionary. 
probably one of the greatest Baptist missionaries, if not one of the greatest missionaries of all time. His name was William Carey. And he is, has such a place in history that he's called the father of the modern mission movement. This is a man who believed that the Great Commission meant they must go to foreign nations. At the time William Carey was a young man and first saved, churches were not sending missionaries overseas. It, it, something that's so common today was not done then. Uh, in fact, one time he was uh, at a meeting and he got up and said, I think we need to send missionaries to uh, the, the heathen and the savages and the pagans across the world and across the oceans. An older preacher stood up, looked this young preacher, William Carey, in the eyes and said, young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid and mine. That was the attitude that William Carey dealt with in his time. He didn't believe that. He thought God's word was his command, his commission to go. And so he took his family and they went to India. Uh, he was uneducated, uh, was not in uh, school in the same way that people in practice in his day and age were. He taught himself over five different languages. His wife was illiterate on her marriage certificate. Her name was Dorothy, but she just put an X there because she could not read or write. And yet God took Dorothy and William and sent them to India. Uh, they tried to work out to the tea plantation workers, but uh, the East India Company would not allow them. They didn't want those people to be evangelized. They didn't want them to have the gospel. And so he was sent from there into Dutch territory. He started his work. While he was doing that work, his oldest son fell sick. And his oldest son died. His wife, in the midst of all this, had a nervous breakdown. And she never recovered her mind. For years, William Carey took care of his other children. He took care of his wife, who was having this nervous breakdown. And after years, she finally died of a fever. He remarried. And after a few years, his second wife, Charlotte, also died. And also, his second son died. During this time, he had learned Bengalese. He had learned Hindi. He translated the Bible into those languages for the Indian people the first time they had their Bible in their native language. He founded a Bible college and he began to train ministry in India and in Bengal for the ministry. Throughout his time in India, he endured sickness, opposition, imprisonment, terrible, terrible stress, terrible, terrible loss. Years before he left for England, he preached a sermon that became famous for launching the modern missions movement. Throughout the sermon, he returned again and again to this phrase, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. William Carey was just a man, but he was a man who never let fear dominate or defeat him. His faith in God overcame every fearful situation, every insurmountable obstacle, every seemingly impossible task William Carey believed the promises of God. He put his faith in the commission of God. And he did not let fear or anything else deter him from serving God to his fullest. He was a man who knew that as a child of God, he need not fear anything this world could do to him. As we go through the next few weeks, perhaps even months, may we know that same reality. Fear has been defeated and we live as super victorious through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And when I need to be reassured of those things, pick up God's Word and listen as the voice of God speaks to us and says, do not fear, I am here. Listen to my words, listen to my promises, and make it through this life as a super victorious child of mine. Let's bow our heads and we'll have a dismissal word of prayer. Thank you so much for being with us. Heavenly Father, we come before you Confessing, Lord, that there are many times that we are fearful. There are times in just the last few days and weeks that we have been dominated by fear and what is happening around us. We have fear for ourselves. We have fear for our family. We have fear, Lord, for our church members, fear for our nation. And Lord, we don't know when this will end and we don't know how it's going to end. But Father, we're so grateful that in your word we've been told there is a way through. And that way through is by looking into your word and listening as you speak to us, father to child, and tell us, don't fear, that there are promises that have been done. Anything this world can possibly offer, 
better than any vaccine, better than any stimulus money. And Lord, we pray that we hold on to those more precious than gold and silver. And Lord, that we put our faith and our trust completely through, that we find ourselves victorious over here. Know that fear has been defeated because of what Jesus Christ has done, what you have done, and what the Holy Spirit continues to do in us. Give us grace. Give us strength. Forgive us our fear. And Lord, may we be able to understand we truly have victory over this fear because of who we are as your children. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen.